Well, hello. Thank you for tuning in to our Lessons of Vietnam show tonight. Here we strive to tell the real story of the Vietnam uh, War and the men and women who, who fought and served in the war. Uh, it's important to dispel some of the myths and misconceptions that are out there. Uh, I am Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran, 67, 68, TET survivor, and your host for the show tonight. And we broadcast here from the uh, Raleigh, North Carolina studios of Nissan Communications. And uh, they gave us the opportunity to tell the real story of the Vietnam War. We appreciate them uh, giving us this time in, in airspace. You're welcome and encouraged to participate with your host, which is me. Uh, and when we have guests, uh, with your comments or questions, as you can see there, the numbers and the um, uh, computer Skype, um, computers 2K voice to come on and ask questions, take part of the show, tell us what you think, and so forth. Uh, tonight's show is part two of Heroes and Zeros, part two. Uh, we didn't finish it up last uh, last time, so we want to get sure we uh, got everybody in. So tonight's uh, Heroes and Zeros Part 2, and we're getting started on our, I think we're starting out with a hero. Yes, we are. Uh, this man is uh, Captain Rocky Versace, just like the Versace who did the clothes and so forth, but I don't think they're related in any way. Uh, Rocky Versace is the bravest man you've never heard of. I have uh, two friends that were in, in Vietnam who were uh, POWs. Uh, they served time in the, uh, in the jungles of Vietnam, in the uh, tiger cages and so forth. And the leader of that group uh, was Rocky Versace. Uh, and the other two gentlemen were uh, Nick Rowe and Dan Pitzer. And I've, I've done some shows about them. Uh, uh, Dan uh, recently uh, passed... Uh, years ago from uh, problems with Agent Orange. Uh, Nick was actually assassinated in the, in the Philippines, which is another show. But this is Rocky, and uh, Rocky actually had um, couldn't make up his mind there for a while whether he wanted to go into the ministry or going to uh, uh, the military academy, West Point. Keep try All I could think of at the time was Wake Forest, but it's West Point. Uh, excuse these uh, uh, senior moments here. But he decided to go to West Point, and uh, the rest of it, as we say, is history. Okay. And uh, that, by the way, that's the Medal of Honor that he was uh, given after uh, way too many years. This is uh, his uh, tombstone uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. There's nobody in it uh, because his remains have never been found. Uh, they weren't even certain he had been killed there for a while. But uh, this is a stone that's uh, there at Arlington Cemetery. Uh, the last memory of the uh, Versace was that of his fellow captives who described uh, the stalwart officer loudly singing, God bless America, from his tiger cage the night before his execution. And that was Nick and Dan uh, talk about um, they heard him singing to the top of his lungs, uh, God bless America, uh, and so forth. And as it says there, uh, he was thinking about going into ministry, which I've already told you, okay? Uh, from uh, This is the, most of the information we have about uh, Rocky is from uh, Nick Rose's uh, book, Five Years to Freedom. And you can see it there. It was written by Nick. And uh, he wrote a couple other books, but uh, this is really uh, a super book. I highly recommend you read it. Uh, it's awesome to find out what one uh, group of men can do to another group of men. But um, from Colonel Nick Rowe's book uh, of his and Dan Pitts and Rocky Versace captured in, in time as a POWs in the tiger cages of jungles of South Vietnam, November 1963. After they were captured, uh, they got ambushed. Uh, they were with uh, Arvin soldiers and they got ambushed and they were stripped of their uh, boots and socks because they, so they couldn't run through the, uh, through the jungles and so forth. They were put. They were blindfolded, and their hands were t tied behind them. And uh, they put them in. First of all, they put them in uh, sand pans and, and carried them down the river for a while, and then moved them un under cover to a small grass hut. In the early hours of the first long night, they could hear the cr nearby cries of the badly wounded Captain Versace, Box C, Box C, which is Vietnamese for doctor. Uh, he got shot in the in leg, and it was a good part of his kneecap gone. Uh, 
Uh, there's an example of a sand pan. After a few hours later, the Americans had been placed in a sand pan and transported to a makeshift camp within the forest, surrounded by knee-deep mud and heavy vegetation. And I can tell you, uh, buku, whole lot of leeches and mosquitoes. There, the three men were placed together in a small cage made of mangrove logs and nailed and tied together with barbed wire. Uh, we call those uh, tiger cages. And uh, you can see there an example of a tiger cage uh, that kept them in. It was just large enough to contain the three of them. It was a cramped and uncomfortable prison for three men, all of whom were wounded. Uh, all three of them were uh, wounded. Rocky was probably wounded the worst. Uh, Captain Precise's leg left him groaning and in great pain. Uh, one of the uh, BAR, which is uh, Browning Automatic Rifle Rounds, appeared to have penetrated the bone near the knee. Precisely also suffered from two wounds in his back. And they, and they did not get a lot of uh, medical treatment at that time. This is uh, one of the examples also of a bamboo cage. Uh, I know that uh, at, at some time they were in a cage like this, was actually hung up in the air. Uh, Lieutenant Rowe was still hurting from his wounds inflicted by the grenade that went off when, uh, when he was trying to help Rocky. Uh, Sergeant First Class Pitzer had done his best to set his own broken ankle. He pleaded for the enemy to allow him to treat Captain Precise's leg, but not until the next day was any medication, medical attention at all given to any of them. After breakfast of rice and canned fish, none of the Americans could eat. They just uh, weren't quite ready for that yet. A medic cleansed uh, Versace's wounds and gave him a shot of penicillin. Four days later, the VC took Rocky away to a makeshift hospital, which uh, was probably not exactly what you would go would be um, uh, cleanest hospital in the world. In fact, they even use hospitals out in the swamp up on platforms. But that's what Kataka Cage looks back. And uh, I know there's a picture of uh, Rocky, uh, excuse me, of Dan and, and uh, Nick on, in one of those tiger cages hanging like that. So it uh, doesn't look very comfortable. After about a week, Roe and Pitzer were taken from their cages, blindfolded and transported by a sandpan to what appeared to be a BC training camp deep within the Yumen Forest. Now, the Yumen Forest was in the southern, southernmost uh, part of uh, Vietnam. Uh, down in the swampy areas. When the blindfolds were removed, they were marched around by the camp by the youngest and smallest of the Viet Cong soldiers. As you can see there in that particular case, there's a, a Vietnamese woman, a uh, North Vietnamese woman leading uh, a prisoner around. Uh, they like to take those pictures like that and uh, use them for propaganda. Uh, so that's what they were doing there is for propaganda. Uh, the communists were always big on propaganda. After several pictures were taken, Captain Precisely was brought out of the makeshift hospital and all three Green Beret prisoners were photographed again in cleverly arranged settings, anything to for their propaganda. For the most part, it would be the last time either of the men would actually see Captain Precisely, though certainly they heard from him. Uh, and then as they're uh, taking a prisoner there, leading him around, it was pretty wounded, pretty bad. That is not uh, Versace. Uh, it was just an example of another POW that was captured and so forth. So. As captain and the ranking prisoner, Versace had assumed responsibility for the small prison population. Uh, the code of conduct always says that the man with the highest ranking for the longest period of time is in charge. He held, it in his, he held in his own cage out of view of Rocky, oh, excuse me, of Roe and Pitzer. Dan Pitzer later wrote that some of the worst punishment the three men endured as at night guards would come to the cages, tell the prisoners on the lenient policy of the National Liberation Front, we're going to wash your mosquito net and, and want your pajamas too. And you can see uh, a prisoner with his hands tied behind his back in a uh, uh, pretty strict uh, position there and now they're going to take his uh black pajamas that they have put them in and wash them and so forth so uh so here they are walk, washing uh uh this actually the story here is by from nick but it gives you the same story because all three men went through the same thing as you can see there uh those are about the size of what my mosquitoes look like in vietnam uh here you are, they were uh, getting dark. Uh, 
they get, they're going to stake you out there. And then your first question you want to ask is, where are my clothes and my mosquito net? Because they're naked out there and they're staked out in leg arms. And then you go to, ouch, die, you little bastards. My body was soon completely covered with swarming, probing insects. The first sensation of a hundreds of simultaneous penetrations and injections of the insect's anticoagulant is almost exquisitely pain, like the sharp bite of a lemon juice on a fresh tooth extraction. It rapidly becomes an intolerable annoyance. It could feel the, I could feel the pulpy mass in my hand each time I slap it as it concentrated on stings and crushed another 50 of my tormentors. Uh, Dan said that, uh, talking to him, that within an hour, it, his, his face was swollen up so much he couldn't see, and he couldn't, his mouth was just, he couldn't go, get his mouth open. But um, you can kind of get the idea there. Uh, there was no spot on my body that was not covered. They dove at my face, neck, arms, legs. They crouched with a fanatical urgency. The night uh, wore on without a bit of relief. Constant, unrelenting torment was indescribable. I found myself slumping, exhausted into momentary bursts of agony washing over my body. The leg irons seemed to be living creatures binding my ankles. Uh, that's a pretty graphic explanation there. Uh, Three weeks after the fateful battle outside of Lacour, which is the battle that they were captured in, where they had been captured, Rocky Versace had made his first escape attempt. Now, here he's got his kneecap blown off just about. Still recovering in the makeshift field hospital, he dragged himself outside and crawled into the dense jungle of the human forest. Now, you can see there in the picture, there's a lot of swamp and a lot of water in the human forest. Uh, and he's crawling, going to get away. Still suffering from his wounds, even crawling was almost impossible. But he crawled, he did. At the slow pace, dragging his body through the jungle, it didn't take the Viet Cong long to recapture him. The man was determined. Rock was returned to camp, placed in leg irons, and received no further treatment for his infesting leg wounds. Placed on a starvation diet of rice and salt, he was beaten and tortured but refused to break. That is actually a picture in uh, uh, the Hanoi Hilton, uh, but the leg arms were the same way out in the jungle. Uh, you can see there. His Viet Cong jailers told the other American POWs that precisely remained unbroken, even when on at least one occasion his tormentors had attempted to coerce him into cooperating by twisting his wounds and infected leg. See, so part of the problem was Rocky spoke French. He also spoke Vietnamese. So he argued back to them in French and Vietnamese so they didn't understand. So they all not, not they knew what he was saying when he was calling them all kinds of names and, and so forth. But um, okay. Now, I couldn't find a hot box picture that I wanted, but this is uh, basically a hot box that you just big enough for a person to get in and to close the uh, door on you, and it's hot. I can tell you because in Vietnam, and there's no air going through there between the bugs and the heat and humidity. Uh, that's the kind of place you don't want to be. Because they could not break Versace, the Viet Cong labeled him a reactionary and unrepentant for his war crimes against the Vietnamese people. So they always said that we were not uh, prisoners of war. We were criminals. From, uh, and we had, uh, our prisoners had actually uh, created war crimes against the North Vietnamese people. They isolated him from other prisoners. Shackle him in his, in, in his, on his back in irons. He was confined to a hot isolation box measuring six feet long, two feet wide, and three feet high. And he was six, I think he was about six two. To quiet him, many nights his mouth was gagged. When the gag was removed, Rocky Versace would defy, again defy his tormentors in all three languages he spoke, English, French, and Vietnamese. The Defense Prisoner and Missing Personnel Office, DPMO, reported Captain Versace demonstrated exceptional leadership by communicating positively to his fellow prisoners. Whenever he would holler out and kind of kept their uh, hopes up and so forth. Uh, he, by communicating positively to, uh, positively to uh, fellow uh, prisoners, he lifted morale when he passed messages by singing into the popular songs of the day. In other words, he would sing whatever was popular. 
uh, when he back here, and he would add whatever message he needed to tell the uh, other prisoners. When he uses Vietnamese language skills to protest improper treatment to the guards, Captain Precisely was again put in the leg irons and gagged. This is some of the medals, and he was a Special Forces uh, Airborne Ranger, uh, so forth. So. Unyielding, now there's a prisoner, and it looks like Dan, uh, uh, Nick. Uh, unyielding, he steadfastly continued to berate the guards for their inhuman treatment. The Communist guards simply elected harsher treatment for, by placing him in an isolation box to put him out of earshot and keep him away from the other U.S. POWs for the remainder of his stay in the camp. They tried to, uh, it's hard out there in the jungle to have the uh, isolation, but because they had it where you couldn't see his cage, but he was uh, made a lot of noise. However, Captain Versace continued to leave notes in the latrine for his fellow inmates and continued to sing even louder uh, so they could hear him. His escape attempt shortly after his capture, despite his, his futility, also would not deter him. The unbreakable Rocky, Versace is known to have attempted to escape at least three times more, each again with futility, and every attempt allowed, followed by beatings and torture. Still, he never gave up and never quit trying. Uh, that's some of the uh, torture uh, that the North Vietnamese communists use. So. There's uh, a, a one of Rocky's... Uh, POW bracelets that a lot of people wore different bracelets and so forth. I wore one uh, for years from um, uh, Worth Millard from uh, Wilson, North Carolina. As two months stretched into four months, all four American prisoners had wasted away, suffering from a meager diet, disease, and their mistreatment in the hands of the enemy. They all had dysentery really, really bad. Captain Rossi seemed to suffer the worst. Whatever the Viet Cong tried to do to him, he resisted. Rocky lived the code of conduct, refusing to tell the enemy more than his name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. He lived valiantly and heroically by the West Point motto, duty, honor, country. He would not have anything to do with anything that they did. He could have kept his mouth shut and probably missed out on a great deal of um, uh, torture. This picture you see here is actually was a first day uh, issue, a car, uh, postcard, but the picture is actually uh, Nick Rowe sitting in uh, President Nixon's office uh, when uh, talking to uh, President uh, Nixon, where Rocky is saying, uh, excuse me, Nick Rowe is saying that Rocky Versace was the greatest soldier he'd ever seen and he needed to get the Medal of Honor, and the president at the time agreed to check it out. Uh, but it was only up until recently that uh, Baraki was actually given the uh, Medal of Honor. Uh, Captain Rosasi's own resistance became the primary focus of the enemy, shifting attention away from the other prisoners and focusing the efforts and anger of the Viet Cong on himself. It was a cross the young soldier bore with dignity. In other words, he took all, he took the, as much of the uh, attention and punishment and uh, mistreatment from the other soldiers. Not that they uh, missed out on a whole lot, but uh, this is some of the propaganda. Join the Communist Party this way to progress. More recently, BC had begun a program of indoctrination for their American POWs, a litany of re-education sessions of Vietnamese communist uh, history. Propaganda accusations of American aggressions against the people of Vietnam. Now, they never mentioned the aggression they had against the people of the South. It was only the Americans' uh, aggression against them. And this is one of the things that they do. But every day they would try to get the prisoners and, and uh, get them to uh, listen to teachers who would get in there and tell them about how wonderful communism was and how wonderful the uh, North Vietnamese uh, Communist Party was. And, of course, uh, Rocky wouldn't have anything to do with it. There's another one there. Uh, most of the POWs had adopted what they call a sit and listen attitude to these sessions, accepting the fact that they were forced to be present for the tirade of enemy propaganda. 
they soon learned that the best way uh, would just kind of sit there and uh, dream about being home or whatever, just not pay a whole lot of attention, but keep your mouth shut. They quietly tuned it out, knowing you to argue or otherwise respond would be fruitless. It would only result in harsher treatment. But not so Rocky Versace. He was promised better food and better treatment if he only would quicker arguing with the people who was doing the indoctrination, teachers, and accepting their propaganda. That's all he had to do is start getting food and proper uh, medical treatments. Captain Versace still would not bend. Time and again during this sessions from a distance row and Pitzer could hear Rocky arguing with the re-educators, rebutting their philosophies in their own language. On this night late in February, Rowe could hear the re-educators arguing once again and they tried to break the unbreakable. It had taken two guards just to force the intrepid Green Beret to attend the class. In other words, he wasn't even going. They had to drag him. Uh, two guards had to drag him to this um, to the class. Across the darkness of the camp, because there ain't a whole lot of street lights out there in the jungle, uh, he could hear the voice of Captain, this is Nick, uh, Captain uh, Hubert Humbert R. Varasi loudly proclaimed, You can make me come to this class, but I am an officer of the United States Army. You can make me listen. You can force me to sit here, but I don't believe a word of what you're saying. That's one of the propaganda people trying to indoctrinate him, but uh, he argued with them all the way. August 8, 1964. Now, this is some of the people that was uh, ended up at the camp there with Rocky and Nick and Dan uh, Rohrbach. Sergeant First Class Rohrbach there in the front was one of the ones that, when I said four while ago, he was one of the ones that uh, was Rocky. Nick Rose stirred uncomfortably in his cramped bamboo cage as he heard the commotion in the darkness coming from the distant vicinity of Rocky Precise's prison cage. Nick and Dan were weak, suffering from frequent diarrhea despite their own deplorable conditions. Neither of them were as bad off as uh, Captain Versace, which foretold things that uh, happened. Rising above the commotion, they could hear the voice of Rocky still defying his captors. In full resistance, Rocky filled the darkness of the human forest with a song to echo the beliefs of his valiant spirits. And you can see what you run across when you're out there in the human forest, the snakes, the bats, uh, the swamps, the mosquitoes, uh, leeches, and so forth. As you can see, that is the southern part of South Vietnam. The Saigon, as you can see, is up there. So it's uh, there's not a whole lot of solid land there. But uh, okay. The following morning, Nick was released from his leg irons and caged long enough to walk to the camp kitchen for his meager ration of rice. As he walked past the area where Captain Versace had been held, all that remained was a twisted piece of aluminum that had been Rocky's cup and pan and a pile of bloody rags. What remained of Rocky's gray POW pajamas? Just rags. The night, of the, the night one of the guards came to Rose Cage and told him that the National Liberation Front had been forced to take drastic action against Captain Precisely because he continued to be opposed to the front. Indeed, that was the last night Lieutenant Rowe or any other American would ever hear the voice of Captain Rocky Versace. Nick Rowe would never forget that valiant warrior's last words, sing defiantly into the darkness as they let him off. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the ocean white with, uh, white with foam. He sang that knowing that he probably would not sing anything very soon. Versace, an army captain from Alexander, executed by his Vitcon captors in 1965, when he was 27 years old. Rocky was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor by President George W. Bush. Remember a while ago when I talked about uh, Nixon was promised that they'd give it to him and Ford was going to give it to him? Well, it didn't get to happen up until uh, George W. Bush uh, did it. Uh, Nixon kind of got tied up in a little thing called Watergate. For the extraordinary extra resistance he displayed under turbo cruel conditions, he was the first Army soldier to receive the award for his action while the captivity uh, defense historians say. So he was the first uh, POW to receive the uh, Medal of Honor because of his resistance. 
Now, anyhow you look at it, Rocky Versace uh, was a true hero. Now, let's talk about a zero. United States Congress. United States Congress, uh, if I was an ally and I'd look at the history of the United States Congress, even back then, they didn't do nothing. Uh, the United States Congress uh, is not real good for supporting the allies. In fact, they do a better job of supporting our enemies than they do our allies. The reason I gave them a zero, on April the 10th of 1975, President Gerald Ford appealed directly to those members of the Congress in the evening joint session televised to the nation. In that speech, he literally begged Congress to keep the word of the United States. But as President Ford delivered his speech, many of the members of Congress walked out of the chamber. You see, when Nixon and Kissinger came up with the Paris Peace Talks and everybody signed that agreement, our agreement was to continue to support the South Vietnamese people and the South Vietnamese government. Many of them had invested in Americans' failure in Vietnam as war protesters. They had participated in demonstrations against the war for many years. They wouldn't give the aid that was promised. On April 30th, South Vietnam surrendered and re-education camps were constructed, and the phenomenon of the boat people began. If the South Vietnamese had received the arms that the United States promised, then they would have been, the results may have been different. It already had been different uh, because of the, uh, the South Vietnamese soldiers did well for themselves. Uh, in fact, I went to a Vietnamese restaurant today, and uh, my friend there was not there. Uh, he fought for 30 days after the fall of Saigon until they ran out of food and ammunition and so forth. And I found out from his granddaughter, he's actually gone back to Vietnam, which really surprised me because he said they'll never go back. But that is one of the Russian tanks, one of the 700 Russian tanks that burst through uh, up until Saigon and bursting through the gates of the presidential palace. The North Vietnamese leaders admitted they were testing the new uh, president, Gerald Ford. And they took one village after another, then cities, then provinces. And our only, and our only response was to go back when I word to the South Vietnamese people. What they did was when Nixon came out of office, they would, uh, they would move forward a little bit, attack this little hamlet and wait by, and then sit back and wait and see what the United States and Congress would do. They didn't do anything. So then they'd make a little bit larger uh, foray into South Vietnam and attack a little bit bigger place. And the United States Congress and the president and would do nothing, just sit there. So finally, they got the idea, hey, the United States is not coming back. The United States did not resupply the South Vietnamese as we had promised. It was then that the South Vietnamese knew they were on the road to South Vietnam's capital city, Saigon, that was soon to be renamed to Ho Chi Minh City. And you see the picture there. I'm going to tell you right here, that picture is not the American embassy that all the people on the news media said it was. That is not the American embassy. The American embassy today does not stand. That building today still stands. I've seen it. Saw it a couple of years ago. It's still there. It was a CIA headquarters on the back of the um, uh, American embassy. Uh, so that picture was not the helicopters getting on the American embassy. Thanks. This is what Congress had to say. Former Arkansas Senator William Fulbright, who, by the way, was also very big in the Ku Klux Klan, who had been the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, made a public statement about the surrender of South Vietnam. This is what he said. I am no more distressed than I would be about Arkansas losing a football game to Texas. The U.S. knew that North Vietnam would violate their accords, and so we planned for it. How did they plan for it? They planned for it by reneging on their promises and their treaties to the South Vietnamese government. That's how they planned for it. So basically, he didn't care about the 58,200 uh, and some people that were on that wall who fought for this country. He didn't care about their, uh, their deaths or whatever because uh, uh, they just decided they didn't want to do anything with it. What we, what we did know was that our own Congress would violate, what we did not know, excuse me, 
uh, that our own Congress would violate their courts and validate uh, and violate them of all things on behalf of North Vietnamese. That's what happened. They they violated uh, they uh, violated them for the communists. Our own United States Congress betrayed the men and women of America and its allies who gave their lives fighting in a war that Congress started. Remember the Gulf of uh, the Gulf of Tonkin? It didn't happen. Congress started the war, and Congress ended the war, uh, but not with much uh, dignity and honor. They betrayed the families of those men and women as well as the people of South Vietnam. But that's the uh, Vietnam Wall from from the air. Now let's talk about a uh, hero. Well, since we just talked about uh, a zero there. Uh, this young man, uh, recently there was a movie out, and let's see, I think it was called, uh, some, I forgot what the name was now. It's really good. It's intense. If you're a veteran, uh, you might want to get somebody to watch it with you or watch it before because it is, if you think Pirate Ryan was um, uh, intense, you need to see this one. It was Hacksaw Ridge. It was about a um, conscientious objector who became a medic in World War II and all the things they did to him going through basic training. Well, this young man is the second conscientious objector to ever receive the Medal of Honor, one in World War II and one in Vietnam. Thomas W. Bennett was always a positive preference where he, wherever he went. His mischievous personality combined with uh, enormous charm endeared him widest diversity of people. In other words, he's one of those people that everybody like. Tom lived his 21 years on this earth with integrity, compassion, and real love for his fellow men. He wanted to heal differences and bring people together, solve problems, and above all, make the world a more peaceful place. A man that stood up for and lived his convictions. And that's hard to do to, uh, back then as it is today. Corporal, 2nd uh, Platoon, B Company, 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry, 4th Infantry Division, Army of the United States. 7th of April, 1947, when he was born. 11th of February, 1969. He's from Morganton, West Virginia. He's on the Vietnam uh, Memorial Wall. Panel 32 West, line 10. He wrote from home from, from the military once about his ethical concern of being in the chapel and thinking, can a man kneel before the flag of our country and cross and keep his integrity? He truly loved our country, wanted to serve, but could not uh, take a life. This is what he wrote while he was in basic training or in, at school, uh, especially in a world with which he strongly disagreed. Enlisting as a medic and as a conscientious objector was an ethically correct and responsible decision for Tom. That's what uh, that was written by a school friend on his uh, epitaph of uh, on the uh, wall memorial. Growing up in Morgantown, Bennett had been active in the Boy Scouts, the Southern Baptist Church. While attending West Virginia University, he became a vocal opponent of the U.S. war in Vietnam and our involvement. Even though he received good grades when he applied himself, I can relate to that, uh, and found himself on academic probation. Uh, he did the same thing I did. They did uh, Atlantic Christian College, which uh, most people know today as Barton. They decided I needed a break, uh, so they kicked me out of school. And uh, they did the same thing to uh, Mr. Bennett and created a problem. However, when his draft notice arrived, Bennett chose to serve his country, believing it was wrong to evade the draft while others had to fight. Even though he was a conscientious objector, he still loved this country and what it stands for, that he was willing to do whatever it took, but would not, would not carry a weapon. Bennett's stepfather, who was a World War II Navy veteran, had raised him to believe in the country and patriotism. A number of his friends had already entered the service and who had been assigned to Vietnam. One of his close friends that had joined the Marines was killed in Vietnam. As you can see there, the handbook for conscientious objectors. There were some things that, uh, that I did not realize at the time. Okay. 
Bennett did not want to dishonor his friend's death by running off to Canada. From a camp draft counselor, he learned that the conscientious objector uh, position or status uh, while serving. Uh, so many men and women went to uh, Canada to escape the draft, but uh, the uh, draft counselor talked to him. Uh, combat medic is what he did, and the saying is, before they cry out for uh, their mothers, before they cry out for God, they call out to me, and I always come for them. Uh, most combat medics, uh, uh, when you're under heavy fire and there's someone wounded and they call for a medic, uh, they move hell and high water to get there, which is why a lot of them didn't come home. Along with other conscientious objectors, in July of 1968, he took weaponless basic training at Fort Sam Houston. I never knew there was such a thing as weaponless tra uh, basic training. Then he completed at Fort Sam Houston, is in Texas, is also where the uh, medical training is, and that's where he finished his uh, medical schooling there. Uh, upon graduation from medical school, Bennett wrote home to his parents, if I am called to Vietnam, I will go. Out of obligation to a country I love, I will go and possibly die for a cause I vehemently disagree with. Bennett arrived in South Vietnam on January 1st, 1969 and was assigned to Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry, in the thick jungles of the central highlands of Vietnam. The unit began a series of strenuous patrols in a dense, mountainous terrain. On February 9th, 1969, his unit came under intense fire, and Bennett risked gunfire to pull at least five wounded men to safety. That evening, his platoon sergeant recommended him for the Silver Star. During the coming days, Bennett repeatedly put himself in harm's way to tend to the wounded. On February 11th, while attempting to reach a soldier wounded by sniper fire, Bennett was gunned down in Chupa Mountain area, about 30 kilometers southwest of Kantum. Nine U.S. soldiers were killed in action during that period. He was trying to do what a medic was doing. President Richard Nixon presented the Medal of Honor to Bennett's mother and stepfather. Bennett was the only, the second conscientious objector to earn the medal in the nation's history and the only recipient during the Vietnam War. The other man during World War II, was uh, name was Desmond Doss, conscientious objector Mac, and he was ordered the first Medal of Honor. And I tell you, the story and this man stood up for, uh, they did everything they could possibly do. They gave him uh, a, a soap beating, they, uh, a blanket party. Uh, everything they could do to Desmond Doss to keep him from, uh, because back then there was not a uh, weaponless basic training uh, there. And uh, it's it just, you just need to read, see that movie, but I can tell you it is intense because of what he did and the fighting and so forth. But um, now this is the Medal of Honor that uh, citation that I'm going to read to you, uh, posthumously to Thomas William Bennett. Citation for conspicuous conspicuous gallantry and integrity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Corporal Bennett distinguished himself while serving as a platoon medic, medical ad, aid man with the 2nd Platoon B Company during re, recon, reconnaissance and force mission. Oh, it doesn't work sometimes. On February 9th, the platoon was moving to assist 1st Platoon of Company D which had run into a North Vietnamese ambush when it became heavily engaged by the intense small arms, automatic weapons, mortar, and rocket fire from a well-fortified and numerically superior enemy unit. Uh, that's usually when they attacked you, when there was more of them than there were of you. In the initial barrage of fire, three of the point members of the platoon fell wounded. Corporal Bennett, with complete disregard for his safety, ran through the heavy fire to his fallen comrades, administering life-saving first aid under fire and then made repeated trips carrying the wounded men to positions of relative safety from which they would be medically evacuated from the battle positions by the uh, 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 helicopters. Corporal Bennett repeatedly braved the intense fire moving across open areas to give aid and comfort to his wounded comrades. He valiantly exposed himself to the heavy fire in order to retrieve the bodies of several falling personnel. Throughout the night and the following day, Corporal Bennett moved from position to position, treating and con confronting 
the, ser the uh, several personnel who had suffered shrapnel, comforting, excuse me, uh, the uh, several personnel who had suffered shrapnel and gunshot wounds. On 11 February, Company B again moved in an assault on the well-fortified enemy positions became heavily engaged with numerically superior enemy force. Five members of the company fell wounded in initial assault. Corporal B Bennett ran to their aid without regard to the heavy fire. He treated one comrade and began running towards another seriously wounded man. Although the wounded man was located for the company position covered by heavy uh, grazing fire, in other words, he was out in front of everybody else, the wounded guy, uh, Corporal Bennett was warned that it was impossible to reach the position. He leaped forward and with complete disregard for his safety to save his comrade's life. In attempting to save his fellow soldier, he was mortally wounded. Corporal Bennett's undaunted concern for his comrades at the cost of his life above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest tradition of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself and his unit in the U.S. Army. Now, here's a man that was all against the Vietnam War altogether and vents against uh, uh, fighting altogether. But when it came down to it, he took his convictions, went to Vietnam as a non-combatant, as a medic, and gave everything he had for his fellow soldiers in his country. That's the type of people we have in this country, folks out there. Uh, we don't hear a whole lot about them, but there was a lot of men and women who served in Vietnam and men and women are out there today that you walk by and never know some of their stories. Now let's talk about another hero. Uh, this is one particular hero I want to talk about. His name is Nemo. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nemo in just a minute. Uh, remembering and, and honoring our forgotten heroes, Vietnam War Dog, Scout Dog Toro, thank you for your service. Rest in peace. But during the uh, Vietnam War in 1960 through 75, about 4,000 American war dogs were employed in various capacities. Of those, a few died early on in the war from food contamination. The Vietnam tropical, uh, tropical climate killed several hundred, according to Army Veterinarian Care. 109 dogs died from heat stroke just in 1969 alone. 109 dogs died from heat stroke. Uh, I knew it was hot and because I was uh, just about to have a heat stroke myself. But uh, okay. This is one of the many memorials for the uh, dogs. By the way, yesterday was the National uh, War Dogs uh, Day. Uh, from June 1970 through uh, to December 1972, 371 dogs were euthanized as being non-effective in combat. And, a, uh, and 148 other died from various causes. During the entire war, 281 were officially listed as killed in action. These are 281 dogs, different breeds, who lost their life uh, protecting our American soldiers. So that's one of the uh, one of the many uh, memorials there. But, uh, more than 9,000 Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force handlers served in Vietnam during America's involvement. Were the dogs of Vietnam effective? Our military experts and armchair generals will probably be debating uh, that question for the next 100 years. But any veteran, Vietnam combat veteran that happened to be part of a patrol that was saved from a VC ambush because of a scout dog's alert or prevented from walking into a minefield will tell you the answer is definitely yes. They were well respected. This is another one of the memorials there, as you can see. Uh, this handler's pouring water into his uh, steel pot for the dog. Uh, the Viet Cong placed a bounty on uh, both the American handler and the war dog. And if they hadn't been doing a good job, uh, the Viet Cong wouldn't have put a bounty on them. Estimates vary, but some state that the dogs may have been responsible for saving at least 10,000 lives in Vietnam. That's a lot of, that's a lot of men. As the Vietnam War neared the end, the idea of going home was greatly welcomed by the troops. But some of the dog handlers were worried. What would happen to their dogs? You know how close you are to your dog now. How close do you think these guys got with the dog? They live with them. I mean, live with them, slept with them every day. A number of handlers tried to get permission to take their dog home with them, but the military said it was afraid that dogs would carry disease and said no. 
There are a variety of reasons. The true war dog trained for sentry and tracking duty cannot be untrained. And there were stra uh, strange canine diseases in Vietnam, which might flourish back at home. And I don't know about the dog diseases, but a lot of uh, people diseases in Vietnam that we brought back home. Okay. Now, this is a special dog. And this is Nemo. He was uh, uh, one of the early dogs. Uh, Nemo was born in October of 1962, began his military career with the Air Force in the summer of 1964. One night in December 1966, Handler, 22-year-old Airman Second Class Robert Thornburg and Nemo were on patrol about a quarter mile away from the air base. And we're talking about the air base being uh, Tonsonut Air Base, which is in, uh, uh, it was right outside of Saigon. Today it's in Saigon, but uh, that was the big base. And uh, not long after they got there, Nemo alerted his handler to the presence of enemy soldiers in the vicinity. Before Thornburg could radio for help, they were fired on. Thornburg released his dog and began firing in the enemy. Nemo was shot and wounded. The bullet entered into his right eye and exit through his mouth. Thornburg was able to kill one Viet Cong soldier before he too was shot in the shoulder and knocked to the ground. Despite his injury, Nemo refused to give in without a fight. The 85-pound dog threw himself at the gorillas, giving Thornburg time to for radio help. A quick reaction team arrived, killing the remaining Viet Cong. Meanwhile, Nemo had dragged himself over to Thornburg and crawled on top of his handler's body to protect him from harm. And he was wounded much worse than uh, Thornburg was. The base veterinarian worked diligently to save Nemo's life. Nemo pulled through but was blinded in the right eye. And you can, you can see the picture there. You can see he didn't have a patch, but you can see his eye. On June, uh, they then they actually uh, fixed him up there and they put him back out on uh, perimeter duty, but they discovered he was having uh, still having medical problems. So on June 23rd, 1967, Air Force uh, headquarters directed that Nemo be returned to the United States with honors as a first century dog to be officially retired from active services. Thornburg was, in the meantime, was taken to Japan for recuperation and uh, then also returned home with honors. But uh, another handler took uh, Nemo uh, by plane uh, back to the United States. When he first got back, uh, the man in charge of the, uh, captain in charge of the kennels there for, a dog, for dog handlers and so forth, he and Nemo went on a uh, tour all over the United States uh, talking to uh, people and, and so forth. So he was uh, a hero coming back. Then he came back and they put him, they built him this dog house and uh, put his sign up there. Uh, Sentry dog, that's his, Nemo, and that's his uh, active duty number. On um, 4 December 1966, Sentry dog um, Nemo, and you can read the rest or whatever. Uh, Nemo then spent the rest of his retirement at the Department of Defense Dog Center, Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. He had given a permanent kennel near the veterinarian facility. A sign with his name, serial number, and details of his Vietnam heroic exports designated his freshly painted home, as you can see there. Okay. Nemo died December 1972 at Lackland Air Force Base shortly before the Christmas holiday. After a failed attempt to preserve his remains, the Vietnam War hero was laid to rest on March 15, 1973, at the Department of Defense Dog Center at the age of 11. Nemo, A534, 37th Special uh, 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 Police, that was the uh, police squad, Fairchild Air Force Base, uh, Washington, Tonsonute, Republic of Vietnam. He was born in Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington. Uh, and served at Tonsil. In remembrance of Nemo and his faithful service to the United States Armed Forces, may all who hear the story of Nemo know the best true measure of a man's best friend. But he lived to 11 years old. He was about four uh, when he went in, uh, three, about three, uh, I think two and a half years old when he became a, uh, a, a guard dog or uh, a dog of war. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the, the dogs and so forth. Uh, 
that what they did was they started turning over as we were retreating, uh, coming back in 72, they started turning their dogs over to the Arvins, which were the South, uh, South Vietnamese military. But there were so many of them, uh, the Arvins had more dogs than they know what to do with and more dogs they needed. So um, I have a feeling that some of the dogs were euthanized, but I also have a feeling that some of them ended up as, as in somebody's dinner pot. Uh, but the Dog Handlers Association uh, kept protesting about leaving the dogs and not being able to bring them home. So they uh, decided to take 200 dogs to uh, Long Bend, uh, which was the uh, large military installation. Uh, in fact, that's where I was during the war, uh, right outside of Sa 20 miles out of Saigon, and they kept the dogs there in quarantine. And they finally came back to just before in 74, they came back to the dogs and uh, about a hundred of the dogs were, uh, for whatever reason, they did not be able to uh, send back. But there was, uh, from what I understand, there was a hundred dogs brought back. But there was, uh, there's several different kinds of dogs they trained. They had one that was a tracker dog. They had one that was like a sentry dog. And they had one that was an attack dog. And I'm not certain. I don't think they brought the attack dogs back. I think they brought some of the, uh, uh, the tracker dogs or whatever. But uh, uh, some of the different dogs there. But uh, the thousands of dogs that were taken over there and uh, used and saved a lot of lives and gave their lives. And uh, doing my research, I found there was uh, a lot of uh, different memorials out there for the um, uh, dogs of war. Uh, it's quite a story. Uh, you might want to look it up and, and do some re more research. Uh, there was another dog that was actually uh, Marines that was a hero somewhat like Nemo, uh, but he, did, he, he was killed and uh, uh, they're in Vietnam. So that's some of the heroes and zeros and so forth. And uh, I also want to recommend, and what I'm recommending, I'm trying to, uh, since I'm trying to give you the true stories and so forth, and anytime you uh, see the show and you think I said something that's not quite true or, or not a true at all or, or whatever, please let me know because that's the whole idea of the show uh, is to get the real truth out there and tell the real story that we're not all baby killer, uh, drug addicts, uh, crazy uh, people who start shooting people and so forth, as we will uh, call when we came home. So there's a website I'm going to highly recommend, and they have started a, uh, a e-newsletter. That is a Vietnam Veterans for Factual History site, and they've got some good information there. So I uh, encourage you to go to their website. Uh, uh, check me out any way you can. Uh, if you're a veteran out there or you just have a comment, let me know. Um, uh, thank you for watching our show. We hope you had some, uh, had some value for you. Uh, if you wish to see the show again, uh, of course, you go to www.nissancommunications.com uh, slash live, and you can go to On Demand and see any of the past shows or, or uh, tell your friends about it. Uh, if you like the show, tell your friends. If you didn't like the show, tell me uh, so I can fix it. Uh, our next show will be March 28th. It will be Vietnam Comparisons and Myths. I know I've talked a lot about the myths and so forth of uh, the Vietnam War, but this is um, uh, some of the information that I've got this show. This is going to be a two-parter also. Uh, there's so much information out there, I couldn't do it in uh, one part, so I had to go to two parts. But it's going to be talking about uh, some comparisons, uh, World War II, uh, Korea, uh, and Vietnam and so forth, and I know you want to tune in and see uh, how we dispelled a lot of the myths out there uh, about the education of the Vietnam vet, uh, how we served, uh, that we served well. Uh, we had good leaders. Uh, so much garbage had come out about uh, the Vietnam War and how we supposedly lost the war. Uh, as I said before, we didn't lose the war. Uh, United States Congress gave the war away to the communists. Uh, we were winning when we left. Uh, the Vietnamese fought, South Vietnamese people fought very well up until the time they ran out of food, ammunition, medical supplies, and so forth. They started taking 12 helicopters to put one together so they could fly. So all that information is out there, but um, 
depending on where you look, there's a lot of garbage out there too. It, I was amazed at some of the stuff I found uh, recently out there. So uh, what we're going to be doing is, again, it's comparison, not taking anything away from the World War II soldier or the Korean soldier. I have an uncle that was in Korea, and I tell you what, uh, there's no way I would want to be there. Uh, if I had a choice between Korea and Vietnam, I'd take Vietnam a whole lot more because uh, Korea was nasty, nasty, nasty. Every war has its own bad parts. But uh, when we came home, the uh, some of the former soldiers didn't want anything to do with us Vietnam vets because they had been listening to war protesters who called us baby killers. We were drug addicts. We were all drug addicts. And we might uh, end up uh, going crazy and taking uh, out our rifles and start shooting people uh, at the time or you couldn't get a job half the time. You couldn't you couldn't go into a bar because somebody wants to uh, fight you or, or whatever, just about, unless they knew you very well. But a lot of the uh, American legions, VFWs, and other organizations didn't want us to be members because we were the first group that lost the war. Now, we are still at war officially in Korea. There was no armistice. There was a, there was no end of the war ever signed. But we still support South Korea. But we didn't support South Vietnam. That's something to think about. We're supporting one South uh, group, and but we didn't support the other. And it all goes back to uh, Korea didn't have the war protesters that we had. We had people that were draft dodging and, uh, and that sort of stuff, but we just did not have the same uh, persona that was built about the uh, Viet, uh, Vietnam, uh, so forth. We had a lot of people who were claimed to be Vietnam veterans came back and talked about all the atrocities they had seen or participated in. And you don't hear about it, but a good part of those people were never in Vietnam to start with. And most of it was, I heard somebody say, I can tell you there's nobody better with rumor mills than the military. The military could start a rumor in a heartbeat, the rumors even have rumors uh, of what. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna be stationed here to, for for a week or two, and another rumor is we're gonna leave tomorrow. And the, the true life is that you may leave two days from now. Uh, so the rumor mill is out there. But um, thank you again for tuning in, and looking forward to our next two uh, shows about the uh, Vietnam comparisons and myths, and. Uh, Thank you for tuning in, as I keep saying, because I want you to go out and get all your friends. We need more viewers. Uh, this is all volunteer. Uh, Nissan Communications gives us the time and equipment uh, here. Uh, so uh, Nissan Communications is not getting rich off this show. Uh, we're all volunteers. Uh, I said I'd never volunteer again, but here I am volunteering to do this show because it's important. When I saw the Ken Burns uh, documentary came out, I just got... Uh, I got so agitated of all the garbage put out there and all the stories that still persist about the Vietnam veteran, the Vietnam war. So good night and uh, be sure to come back and, and let me see you again uh, on the 28th of March, 19, excuse me, not 19, 2018. Oh, geez. I'm talking about the sixties and I already got, got back. So thank you very much and good night. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.